Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into this week's Stacker Chat. My name is Gina Abrams, and I'm joined by Muneev Ali, founder of Stacks. Thanks for being here, Muneev. How are you doing today? Doing great. Excellent. Cool. Uh, well, we're all here to learn about Stacks. Um, the Stacks 2.0 blockchain launched earlier this year, bringing apps and smart contracts to Bitcoin. And um, it's been a fun time in the Bitcoin space recently. I was actually uh, lucky enough to join some stackers at Bitcoin Miami last week. And I've got to say, what a pleasure, also a teeny bit of a zoo, um, to be there and to meet everyone um, that makes this Bitcoin community um, and Stacks community so great. And you know, chatting with people there, it's clear that there's still a lot sort of TBD in terms of um, the, the debate of, Bitcoin and sort of where it's going, but everyone there feels potential and, and energy. Um, so that's really exciting. And at the same time, uh, we actually launched a .BTC namespace and application where decentralized names are secured by the Bitcoin blockchain registered by Stacks. Um, and so this is sort of a unique project and there's a little bit of history there. Muni, would you be able to share some background and, and information about the project? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the launch of the .BDC domains was, was super interesting. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realized that uh, it was a single developer, Marvin, who, who worked on a registrar. Uh, and it's, it's completely open source, but other, other people can take a look at it as well. And the way it's built is that there is a smart contract on the Stacks chain that effectively uh, acts as almost like a decentralized domain name system. Right, and you're registering these dark .BTC domains with a smart contract, and the registrar that that uh, Marvin built uh, effectively makes it easy for people to do that. Right, like anyone can do it directly uh, by directly interacting with the smart contracts, sending transactions, or if you want to do USD payments uh, or even Bitcoin payments through a payment processor on the registrar. Uh, you can go to BTC.us and and kind of use that. So there's there's definitely very very uh, interesting and rich history here because uh, decentralized domains are actually the first application that at least I can think of. Right, like they go all the way back to 2011, uh, where people were thinking of other applications of blockchains, like other than money and 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 currency like Bitcoin. Uh, Satoshi himself was actually involved with early discussions around this thing called BitDNS uh, and then Namecoin. And, the, and, the, and, and Satoshi was actually very supportive of this idea of having these other use cases around the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but Satoshi was thinking about how can you do this in a way that you can share the compute power uh, of Bitcoin. And a lot of the work that we have done at Stacks is actually inspired by the same type of design. Uh, if you go back to that time, you would think that if you want to uh, basically modify the Bitcoin blockchain to add uh, support for, for uh, domains, uh, you basically have three options. Like you either try to modify Bitcoin itself. Uh, option B is you go off and start a completely different blockchain. And the third option is that you somehow try to reuse Bitcoin's hash power and, uh, and build it that way, right? So Namecoin, the first fork of Bitcoin uh, actually went for option three, that can we do merge mining and basically uh, a subset of the Bitcoin miners would also mine a separate chain and you can have these, these uh, decentralized domains that way. Super exciting. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, if you think about the design space, like even in the crypto industry right now, uh, that is the fundamental question really, that if you want to have new types of smart contracts, new types of applications, uh, can they be directly on the Bitcoin chain? I think, I think there's more consensus there now that the answer is no. Uh, Bitcoin is not going to change. Bitcoin is not going to store a lot of data. You won't be able to kind of like register uh, additional use cases directly on the Bitcoin blockchain. And then the, the other design spaces are, should you start completely different networks and completely different blockchains? Uh, clearly Ethereum comes to mind. This is what Vitalik did after first trying to start smart contracts on Bitcoin. And then also some new, new blockchains like you know, Solana, Avalanche, Algorand, and so on. And then there's a design space of can you reuse Bitcoin's uh, security and effectively 
uh, have these extensions on Bitcoin without really modifying Bitcoin. And that's the cap that Stacks is in, uh, which, which I think is still more of an underexplored, underappreciated area in crypto, because in some ways it's actually easier to start a, a separate network than to try and work with an existing system like Bitcoin. And, and there, it can actually be more, more complicated. Uh, and interestingly, uh, when, when Namecoin kind of like forked off of uh, Bitcoin with merge mining, uh, these domains that they were starting were actually the original NFTs because uh, domains by definition are non-fungible tokens. Like every domain is unique and, and you know, could be traded, could be, could be resold and so on. So even the history of NFTs goes all the way back to when uh, decentralized names uh, started off uh, on, on blockchains. So when the .pdc uh, domains uh, launched on Stacks, in many ways, like we were coming back full circle because this is the original problem that in many ways even led to different blockchains uh, being built outside of Bitcoin. And Stacks is doing it in a way uh, so that it's very close to Bitcoin. Uh, it, is, it is in the broad, broader Bitcoin ecosystem. And, and these things can uh, benefit from the security of Bitcoin itself. So if you, uh, if you are basically getting a uh, domain name, the question to ask would be that, uh, you know, the blockchain on which you're getting this, in this domain name, is it going to be around 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and so on? And that's the reason to try and build on Bitcoin, because uh, with Bitcoin, I think, at least in my view, the probability that the Bitcoin blockchain is going to be around 20 years from now, 50 years from now, even 100 years from now is actually a lot higher. So that's the reason to do it. And we are doing it in a way that is very much inconsistent with the original uh, motivation that even Satoshi had, that can you, can you add these use cases uh, while reusing the compute power of Bitcoin so that you almost have a shared uh, resource that everyone benefits from if that is the hash power uh, of Bitcoin. Absolutely. Now, with these domains, I feel like it's opening up a world of potential. Um, maybe there would be a marketplace in the future where people could trade them. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about what, what you envision as, as what would be really cool for these .ptc-based domains. Yes, so I think I think uh, Marvin was probably not even like fully ready uh, for this launch. It was meant to be more of a community thing. And I think I, I tweeted it out and then the, the registrar started getting uh, a lot more uh, traffic. Uh, so kudos to uh, Marvin for staying up, you know, uh, putting in late nights for, for, uh, for a couple of days and getting through all of the backlog. And for all the people who are really interested in trying out uh, and getting their .bdc domains, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, I believe most of the initial traffic spike has been processed, but there might, if there are still any issues, I think Marvin and, and the team, you included Gina, have been very helpful and they can, uh, they can help the folks. So after the, this initial community launch, I do think that um, uh, it would be great to get like more Bitcoiners uh, their .pdc domain, because interestingly, like it can sort of become like your, um, your online identity in a way. Right, so you could you can have integrations with chat applications. Uh, you can actually uh, try to. So this is not on the traditional uh, DNS system, uh, but you can have integrations with browsers like Brave or Oprah, who has been very. Uh, they've been they've been more open to integrating decentralized technologies. So uh, if if that integration happens, then in Brave you could just type in Muni.bdc and completely bypass the traditional DNS system. Uh, to, to directly resolve to whatever I want you to resolve to probably my website or something like that. And in the meantime, the BTC.us uh, registrar has an interesting service where you can get a subdomain there and it can actually route um, traffic for you. So obviously in this model, you're depending on the owner of the BTC.us uh, uh, domain, uh, but you can, you can basically still point your subdomain to wherever you want to. It's, it's a small, interesting feature, but obviously, getting more direct integrations and uh, uh, and even more than that, like integrations with decentralized applications, as I mentioned, like potentially chat applications or other types of, uh, of apps where you can log in directly using, uh, losing your .bdc domain. It could, be, it could be super interesting. For sure. Well, thank you. I'm excited to see what, what comes next with it. Um, 
Now, one thing that you know comes up is basically that Stacks consensus is very unique within the space. It's kind of novel and new, um, and it's connected to Bitcoin. And I'm wondering if you can again share some of more of the details and how it's different from other blockchains um, and other mental models that that folks are so used to. Yeah, so I think I think that's that's a great question because the Stacks model is just so different that um, I'm not surprised that you know people uh, try to fit it in a box that they are familiar with and it doesn't like cleanly fit in and, and and I think it requires a little bit of a deeper look into really trying to understand what's going on here. Um, so I think at a high level, the way to think about blockchains is that uh, there are layer one blockchains that are uh, basically fully independent. You know, they have their own set of miners, their their own cryptocurrency that's used for uh, for incentives. Like so, think of Ethereum as a separate layer one uh, from Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a layer one, and then there are, are other new types of layer ones as well, like you know Solana, Avalanche, Algorand, so on. And and in many ways, L1s are probably the easiest to understand because you just think of them as, hey, it's a completely separate network, has nothing to do with any other blockchain, and that's that's in some ways like easy. And then you you get into the world of like, you know, there are side chains, there are merge mine chains, there are uh, L2s, and then these things are also like not uh, really well defined. Uh, so one of the things I'm, I'm looking into is uh, working with a, a couple of other computer scientists like Jude or Aaron, like trying to come up with uh, better definitions for what these things are. Uh, but I think roughly speaking, um, uh, a merged mine system like you know name name coin, um, it basically takes uh, hashes or or a subset of the miners of of a chain like Bitcoin, and those miners are also miners on the merged mine chain. Uh, but they are basically not recalculating the hashes. Uh, the calculations that they've already done, uh, they're reusing that that same calculated hash on the merge mine chain. So in, in some ways, like at a high level, a merge mine chain has has a subset of the security uh, of the of the main chain, right? So in some ways, it's kind of like connected, uh, but in many ways, it's a, it's an independent blockchain, right? Like it has its own history. It has nothing to do with the history of of the uh, of, the, of the main chain like Bitcoin and, and so on. Uh, L2s are very different, especially the new generation of L2s that are being defined on top of Ethereum, where uh, there could be mechanisms where uh, basically you have some sort of a, uh, a mechanism where the security of the L2 is actually dependent on the L1 completely. Right. So there is some sort of a fraud proof that the L1 smart contract can actually calculate. And that's a that's a very, a very powerful model, actually. Like I've, I've been a supporter of L2s for several years. I've never been a big fan of sharding and the ETH2 design. Uh, I think L2s are much more realistic ways of actually having having scaling uh, in, in blockchains. And that's that's like kind of like you know one one design. In terms of like uh, what Stacks is. Uh, as I mentioned, that it's, it's a very unique system. So let's try to dive in a little bit. That how is it unique, and how is it how is it different, and, and more in interestingly, how does it benefit from Bitcoin? So basically, what we have done with Stacks is the best way to model Stacks is that it's a L1 system, meaning that it is a independent blockchain with its own miners and its own incentive mechanism, the, the, the Stacks cryptocurrency that these miners are mining for securing the network, but we were trying to solve the problem that we have a very secure base layer L1 uh, Bitcoin. How can we how can we use that and benefit from that instead of having a completely isolated, disconnected network? So the problem that we worked on is can you actually directly connect two L1s together, right? In in a, in a consensus algorithm. So part of the consensus of the of the Stacks blockchain actually runs on the Bitcoin side. Uh, so it's really like the way to think about this is that it's not it's not merge mine, it's not a side chain, it's not an L2. It's literally like visually try to think of that. It's two L1s uh, that are getting connected to each other. And Bitcoin, the way to think about that is that like Bitcoin is the leader in a way there. So Bitcoin doesn't care that another L1 is coming and trying trying to connect to it. Bitcoin is agnostic. Bitcoin miners don't even know that, that this thing is, is happening and they, they don't need to know that. 
but the the follower L1, let's call it the follower L1, which is which is stacks, actually has full visibility into the leader L1, Bitcoin, right? So uh, that's how smart contracts on stacks have full visibility into Bitcoin. If a transaction happens on Bitcoin, it can trigger logic within the the, the Clarity smart contracts deployed on stacks. So in this way, like it's L1, L1 connection, and one of them is the source of truth, the leader, which is Bitcoin. And one of them uh, basically follows the source of truth in Bitcoin, meaning that if there's a fork on Bitcoin, the stacks chain would automatically follow the forks on Bitcoin. Right? You don't have to do, you don't have to worry about forks on Bitcoin because the, 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 the stack chain would, would automatically follow them. So the benefit of, of that actually comes from, I think, um, because big, because the the transactions on the stack side automatically kind of like settle on Bitcoin and they follow the the finality of Bitcoin, right? Uh, so stacks can have faster transactions. Again, as I said, that um, stack the Bitcoin miners have no visibility into stacks. They're just running the Bitcoin chain and they don't care about about other chains. But but stacks has visibility into Bitcoin. So you can have faster transactions like micro like microblocks on the stack side, but but they would all settle in a Bitcoin block automatically, right? And and Bitcoin has probabilistic finality, uh, so the stack side is effectively kind of like following that, right? And interestingly, so if you look at the history of the stacks chain, uh, even if there were any forks on the stack side, the entire history is in a way linked with the Bitcoin history, right? Because these all of these settlements are kind of like happening on Bitcoin. So to rewrite the history of stacks, you would have to also rewrite the history of Bitcoin, which is a very nice property to have. Because what we are, again, like looking at the overall goal of the system, we are talking about 10 years from now or, or you know, uh, 15 years from now. If, if you have a completely separate blockchain, especially if that blockchain is not proof of work, and something catastrophic happens, it would become very hard to even know what happened in history, right? Like going back to the example of the .bdc domains, I got Muneeb.bdc, and I would want that thing to be preserved in history that I got Muneeb.bdc, and I would want that thing to be extremely hard to change like 10 years from now that I got Muneeb.bdc. So we are effectively using the Bitcoin layer to preserving all historical information about stacks, right? And for a, for a new node, if a new node boots up, they can independently look at the Bitcoin history because it's based on proof of work. Uh, so you can just calculate independently what is the right chain, but you can, at the, at, the, at, the, at the same time, you can look at the stacks history and look at the hashes that are on the, on the Bitcoin side, the settlements by, by the stacks miners, uh, to know that which fork on the Bitcoin side is the longest one, on, on the stack side is the longest one and is the correct one. So that, that's, that's kind of like the high level model that you know, all fork histories are kind of like you know, uh, preserved in Bitcoin and you have to rewrite stacks history to rewrite the Bitcoin side. But there's a very interesting uh, other property that happens. And that property is that in, for anyone to launch an attack on the stack side, all uh, these, these, uh, these attacks basically become public by default. Because if someone is trying to create a different fork, let's say there are a bunch of honest miners and there's an attacker and attacker uh, wants to basically take over the network for, for some amount of time, the attack is, has to be public by default. Which is, which is not the case with traditional proof of work or proof of stake. And, and most of the times these attacks are, are reasonable only because they can be private, right? Because if let's say you're working on a different fork of, of a proof of work chain, you'll keep your fork private until you can uh, release it and then you know, perform your attack. But the way stacks work is it, it always looks at Bitcoin's history. So it doesn't recognize any other, uh, the only reality is the Bitcoin history. So even for the attacker, the attacker needs to reveal the attack on Bitcoin. And when the attacker does that, it has a very interesting property that now everybody else in the system actually knows that someone is, is, is trying to attack uh, the, the stack side. And that's a very interesting property because what that does is 
that it it almost like gives a heads up to the honest miners or or to the community that an attack is coming and it makes the the how hard it is to uh, pull off an attack actually a dynamic uh, requirement because you could you could actually tell that a, let's say an attacker was spending x amount of bitcoin to try and and uh, pull off an attack people can react to it because they know that this attack is coming and there are actually mechanisms in place to uh, there's a slow start like a new attacker would 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 need to have a wrap up time as well before before you can try to pull off an attack so it it actually basically says that bitcoin is the is the is the source of truth all of the histories are preserved in bitcoin so for so for stuff that is like very far back in history it's effectively like you know just forget about it like you would you would need an insane you would need to burn an insane amount of capital to even attempt an attack because the honest miners on the stack size will keep making progress as well so if you're trying to uh, have some sort of a reorg you know a thousand blocks deep or you know 2000 blocks deep like good luck right like you would you 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 effectively uh, those types of attacks are uh, probabilistically just just become uh, extremely hard to pull off but if you're even if you're trying to do something that is more short term let's say you're trying to do something within the last 10 stacks blocks or 20 stacks blocks or something as soon as you would attempt it everybody else would know that you're attempting something and that makes the hardness of doing these things more dynamic because the other miners can adjust they can increase their burn and make that attack more uh, harder to pull off and so on so it's a it's a very unique property that is that doesn't exist in uh, in, in even proof of work chains, because you can build up a private history uh, over there and, and doesn't exist in proof of stake chains either. Uh, so Stacks is, it, it, again, it doesn't fit in a box because it is, um, it is I think the best way to think about it, it, it is a L1, L1 connection where Bitcoin's L1 is kind of like a leader and a source of truth. And the Stacks L1 uh, basically follows it and because now uh, the, the Stacks L1 has this extra layer of a source of truth, uh, you can actually use that uh, to design a consensus algorithm that has just new types of properties, properties that other, other types of consensus algorithms just, just don't have. And I think that's, that's probably the best way uh, to, to think about Stacks. And I would like to point out that uh, a lot of times when I talk about you know, smart contracts for Bitcoin, uh, the interesting thing is that there could be direct Bitcoin transactions that are triggering actions on the stack side. So if your Bitcoin just remains on the Bitcoin chain, then you're benefiting 100% from the security of Bitcoin. And I think that's a very, very important distinction to make. Like I, I think I've described a Bitcoin lending application in one of my tweets rounds where your Bitcoin just stays on the Bitcoin chain. So you're lending your Bitcoin and, and there is a collateral on the clarity side. In that, in, in that application, your security of your Bitcoin or the security of this application is mostly dependent on just the Bitcoin blockchain because your Bitcoin just stays there. What you are trusting outside of the Bitcoin blockchain is a clarity contract. And again, that con uh, again the Stacks chain, it will fork if there's a fork in Bitcoin. Uh, it, it, in, it, in many ways, it's, it is linked with Bitcoin, even though it has its own security budget as a separate L1. It is in many ways linked with Bitcoin and you can analyze the, the clarity contract and you can have mathematical proofs around, you know, what happens if uh, your Bitcoin doesn't come back by a certain Bitcoin block, this, this contract will release the collateral to you and so on. So I think that's the, that's the way to think about it. And similarly, uh, for other types of use cases where there's some, some uh, logic on the clarity side, that triggers Bitcoin transaction. That's harder to do, but you can do it in a somewhat limited way even right now through the, the POX uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, around more than 500 Bitcoin have already have been transferred using that mechanism. There's logic on the clarity side that is directing transfers of Bitcoin. Again, when, when those transfers are happening on the Bitcoin side, they're happening on the Bitcoin side and they're secured completely by Bitcoin and are not dependent on, on, on the stack side at all. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the applications that developers come up with, they're kind of like hybrid like that, where you know, there's some Bitcoin transaction that triggers an action on the stack side or, 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 or the reverse of that and so on. 
So I think when, when thinking about the security properties of, of stacks, like the devil is really in the details. And I think you really need to understand uh, what type of guarantees you're getting, uh, what is the benefit of connecting to Bitcoin in such unique way, and, 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 and also be very clear about what are uh, kind of like Stack's own security budget. Right? And I think the, the best way uh, to understand this, like we will we'll try to write up more about, uh, about all of these things and publish them as blog posts. Uh, I've, I've even been thinking about uh, updating, uh, you know, some of the, the white paper with some of this information because uh, this is a this is a great learning experience as people are kind of like asking more questions and they're uh, basically trying to better understand the system like that's very helpful feedback because we can take some of that back and update some of the written material and, and make it easy uh, for a broader audience to understand this yeah absolutely there's a ton of complexity there that you just uncovered and i'm thinking about where folks can sort of find out more information um we're continuing to do documentation updates so i think that's a great place um and then maneev you mentioned blog posts um so we'll just continue to to share those um as you mentioned well Thank you so much. That's a wrap for this week. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Um, definitely feel uh, if you're enjoying this, subscribe to the Stacks YouTube channel. And we're just going to continue to do these uh, sessions. And if you'd like to learn more about Stacks, head over to stacks.co. Um, there's a whole resources section list uh, linked there. And also, if you're interested in checking out the .btc domain app that Maneev was mentioning, check out btc.us. Um, and we're going to just be con continuing to tune in next week. So thank you so much. Um, would love to continue to hear from folks. And thank you, Mindy, for being here. Awesome. Thanks a lot.